BBOR Black Box Online Radio, coming to you from West Virginia. Well, to people who have been following our Zodiac Killer uploads, you'll know that um, we've been doing this since 2017, since we've been doing, you know, something about the Zodiac Killer from time to time. And I've said on the channel that I first found out about the Zodiac as a kid, and I started learning stuff about the Zodiac Killer once again in 2011 when I kind of went through sort of, you know, a little bit more of an obsessive phase when I was trying to really become acquainted with the things. But really it was in 2017 when I started putting some things out on online on YouTube. And I would just have to say, the internet is very vast and there are a lot of things to go through. And there are a lot of different things that we need to explore. And like it's before you get to every single book, before you get to every single podcast, before you get to every single radio uploaded show, as well as uh, even just the documentaries that are out there. There's a lot to go through. And one of the things that I had just found was um, an interview on the Opperman Report hosted by Ed Opperman with Thomas Henry Horan. And um, he is someone who is promoting something called the Zodiac Killer Hoax Theory. And the, the title of his book is The Great Zodiac Killer Hoax. And this is something that really just kind of goes to show well, I mean, whatever you're thinking about the Zodiac Killer, it's true. Not every single person was involved, but any sort of theory you have about the Zodiac Killer, it's true. Like, for example, I, um, I've i mentioned the word super conspiracy on this channel in the past, and like when we did our Bruce Davis upload, we talked about how they're kind of, you know, even some super conspiracies going on the Zodiac Killer. This is definitely a Zodiac super conspiracy. Um, that's what Thomas Henry Horn pushes. That's the thing that he is promoting. And that's like, well, like sort of his whole stance on the subject. I mean, every single, and we'll get into some of the things, but the first thing is, if you've been following any of the Zodiac uploads, or that this is your first one, I would just say that I promote something that is called the Group Murder Theory. If you want to go back and listen to an explanation on that, uh, I have an upload called Zodiac Killer Z Psychology. Z just like Zodiac. And um, we talked about how all, every single murder seems to be somewhat different. There are just a lot of very big differences in the Zodiac murders. And that really seems like that there were multiple people involved. And this guy, Thomas Henry Horan, who promotes the hoax theory, says the same thing that all of these murders were committed by different people. And, you know, like, on the one hand, I want to say, yeah, that's music to my ears, except for the fact that we're dealing with, you know, we are dealing with the murders of real people, but I don't think I've ever really promoted the genuine concept that there was no Zodiac Killer. I mean, because hoax theory, that almost makes it seem like it didn't really happen, but, I mean, what he's really trying to argue is that all of these murders were committed by different people. And the thesis of his stuff is that this was something that has to do with the narcotics departments in San Francisco, as well, you know, the drug trade and the confidential informants of the narcotics departments that infiltrate the drug trade. And there's some very detailed reasons for that. I have to say, though, he is very, very detailed in his presentation. And the heart and soul of his kind of stance is that Robert Graysmith, you know, perhaps the most famous... Um, author when it comes to Zodiac stuff is a fraud that 90% of his books are well not really very genuine and like Zodiac and Zodiac Unmasked those things that Robert Graysmith has put out are not very genuine works and I was like well yeah I could have told you that I mean just as kind of like a casual observer of the thing and the reason why is because Almost all of the deep dive research things involving the Zodiac exclude Robert Graysmith. They're just like his stuff isn't useful. And um, there's some very big reasons for that that we'll get into. So we need to stay tuned. Okay, so Robert Graysmith, the most famous writer, is kind of spreading some disinfo. But um, when I said that Thomas Henry Horan is very detailed in his hoax theory, um, if, if the Zodiac killer as a single person didn't commit the murders, well then who did? And his answer is that, um, as we said, it's tied to the narcotics informants at the, um, with the uh, San Francisco police and the journalists. They're also in on this. And the journalists and the investigative reporters, they're also tied into this. For example, let's look at how this would function. Lake Herman Road was not actually a lover's lane. Lake Herman Road was just a parking lot at the top of a hill. 
And, I mean, one of the things, though, is that he doesn't provide a good explanation. Horan, that is, Thomas Henry Horan, does not provide a good explanation about why the two individuals at Lake Herman Road would have been murdered where they were. What he sort of says is they either interrupted a kind of drug deal, what they what they did was, or they kind of showed up unannounced and they interrupted something, they saw something they shouldn't have, or he even goes as far to say is that perhaps David Faraday, the uh, gentleman who was murdered at Lake Herman Road, was a confidential informant for the San Francisco Narcotics Department. And I'm like, what are you talking about? He was 17 years old at the time. And David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen at Lake Herman Road, once again, December 20th, 1968, they were the youngest victims involved with this. And that's one of the reasons why I entertained the Louis Myers theory for a while, that uh, Louis Myers, um, a teenager as well, could have murdered uh, Betty Lou Jensen and David Faraday, as well as committing the other murders because of his first-hand connections to them, and he was of similar age. But the thing is, though, um, I don't really know... He didn't really elaborate on too many details about why he would think that David Faraday was a confidential informant for the narcotics department at age 17, like 21 Jump Street or something like that. I mean, it's like his fake ID in his pocket. Well, who knows? But um, I digress from that because what they're really trying to say is the kind of more hardier stance with that particular issue is that Lake Herman Road was kind of being used as a dump site for narcotics by the Hells Angels. It, it was a dump site for the narcotics trades, like where they have the kind of bulk supplies of, of drugs, and that would get kind of distributed to the nickel and dime dealers, and that perhaps just Betty Lou Jensen and David Faraday interrupted the drug deal, and that's why they were murdered. And they created this thing, eventually, the, being the Zodiac Killer, as a distraction from these murders that were committed from people who were kind of involved with the narcotics trade. And that really begin, but that like that, there's a very large gap from Lake Herman Road, December 20th, 1968, all the way to July 4th, 1969, when we see the um, Blue Rock Springs incident. Sometimes this is reported as July 5th because uh, Darlene Farron was murdered at this time and she did pass away on July 5th. So sometimes it's reported as that. Sure, her, she was pronounced dead at 12.38 in the morning, like just after midnight, 38 minutes after midnight on July 5th. But the actual Blue Rock Springs incident took place on July 4th. And I've always that's always bothered me about why there was this very long time gap. So, okay, I can follow him to this point. But he actually says that there were two shooters involved with... um the murder of Darlene Farron and Michael Mago. He pronounces it Majo. I've always said Michael Mago. Excuse me, Michael, if I've mispronounced your last name all during all these uploads. Okay, so Darlene Farron was actually trying to set up her ex-husband, Jim Phillips Crabtree, as um so described by Horan, and that Crabtree was present during the murder of Darlene Farron. He was involved with the narcotics trade as well, and Darlene Farron was someone who got exposed to the narcotics trade when she was running around the world with a guy that she met when she was a teenager. I mean, I always surprise me about how Darlene Farron was so young, but she had already kind of been divorced, and there were rumors of her having affairs with older men. I was like, wasn't she only, like, you know, in her early 20s or something? I mean, she definitely, I mean, I never did any, I never really much left the couch until I was, like, 23. I mean, so it's like, I was, it's something that always stood out to me. I know we're different people, but there is just a six-month gap in Darlene Farron's life where she ran away from home. Horn says that she had came from a very kind of troubled background. She ran away, and she ran off with a guy. And this is a comment that I had on one of my first Zodiac Killer uploads ever. Someone was like, Darlene Farron was having an affair with a 50-year-old merchant marine. And this actually ties into something called the Tarbox Confession, where a lawyer named Tarbox, it's an easy name to remember, always stood out to me. Uh, the Tarbox got a confession from somebody who was a merchant marine claiming to be the Zodiac Killer. Now, he was never able to reveal that person's name because, um, you know, lawyer confidentiality is very, very intense. Okay, so this uh, merchant marine that Darlene Farron had met was taking her to various places around the continental U.S. as well as the U.S. Virgin Islands. That's one of the reasons um, why Darlene Farron originally went to New York, but she was all... So, I believe she was in New York with Crabtree, but 
Um, then she was also went to the Virgin Islands with this merchant marine guy, and this ties in once again to the narcotics trade. He was involved with this, and Darlene Farron wanted to get kind of revenge on her ex-husband, not the merchant marine, but um, John, Jim Phillips Crabtree at the time. So she wanted to have him set up, but it backfired on her, and she ended up being murdered. So then they had uh, somebody report in the murders uh, under the name of the Zodiac Killer. I also killed those kids last year. It's a way to divert attention away from the Zodiac, way to divert attention away from the kind of wrongdoings of the San Francisco uh, police departments, the narcotics division, and even the journalists themselves because they got pulled into this. And, okay, you might be wondering something. How? You might be saying, why? Like, why are these journalists going along with something like this? I mean, do they just think it's a better story and they're going to publish it? And that's kind of what I was waiting for, like the how and the why. And then this guy, I'm, watching, I'm listening to this interview on the Opperman Report, and he's just like, well, we're not really sure. And I'm like, oh my gosh, dude, dude, dude. I mean, that's kind of one thing. They're still trying to figure it out is what he actually said. And I was like, okay, well, you kind of uh, pulled us into some giant mess. Okay, so are you guys following everything? This is easy, right? This is very simple. This is a very simple Zodiac theory, right? And even though... This gets a little bit more intense. I've said, though, as someone who entertains the group murder theory, I was kind of suspicious in the past about, like, why all the Zodiac killings seem somewhat different. And I thought maybe some guys had gotten together and they had read up a lot on murder and crime and mysteries and history, and they sort of devised a plan to become the most epic serial killer ever. Um, it was just a possibility. I mean, I didn't know. I mean, like, I still don't know. I'm not 100% certain of any of this. It's an unsolved case. It's just like you're kind of trying to make sense of some things, and you got to look at, more importantly, what does not make sense to you. And the thing that I would say about that is that you have something, for example, such as um, the handwriting. The handwriting seems fairly consistent. And I was like, if there were four people who committed the murders, because we have four major incidents in Zodiac activity, Lake Herman Road on December 20th of 68, Blue Rock Springs on July 4th or 5th of 1969, Lake Berryessa, September 27th, 1969, and the Paul Stein murder in Presidio Heights on October 11th very obscure dates, and our last Zodiac upload was just trying to make sense of why these days, I mean, for someone who was so precise, and like, I mean, someone did point out, though, like, if you're gonna get away from uh, Thomas Henry Horne's theory, and like, if you look at the Zodiac cross, though, like, the circle with the, with the two lines going through it, I mean, there are gonna be four points where the two lines are gonna intersect with the cross, and, um, that is going to mean that these uh, four dates are actually lined up with the Zodiac sign on a calendar. I had a recent comment coming about that. I just wanted to mention that. But back to the hoax theory. What I would say with this hoax theory is that, um, I mean, it's hoax is not even a really good word. That's what he calls it. To me, hoax seems like something that wasn't real. What it actually seems like is this is a, there's a very real Zodiac. It's just the Zodiac murders didn't happen exactly the way that we thought they did. So if we're going to continue onward with uh, Thomas Henry Horan's theory about like how this was all tied into the, the narcotics departments as well as the officers and the investigative journalists and all of these things, well, who wrote the letters? Because I'm like, four people committed these different, you know, so incidents and Zodiac activities, but I've always said that I thought only one person was writing the letters. Ever since I did my first upload about multiple perpetrators, it was called Arthur Lee Allen's Partner. I was like, what if somebody else was just writing the letters or something like that? And it seems fairly consistent. You can look at the Zodiac letters yourself on, you know, Google Images and such, and it really does seem like there is one type of handwriting that is kind of consistently carried on throughout all of this. And I began to think, well, you know, of course, who would that be? He provides a name for that, an individual named Hal Snook, S-N-O-O-K, Hal Snook. And he is someone who learned about coding in the Philippines during World War II, and the Zodiac symbols that you see, they actually use some, you know, English letters, of course, but then um, there are also some other symbols that have just been pulled in, and he said that that's actually uh, kind of taken from some sim symbology from a, a very specific island in the Philippines that Hal Snook would have been in touch with, and I, I even googled, you know, Hal Snook um, handwriting, and yeah, that does, it does, his handwriting does seem very similar. Okay, but, okay, but, I mean, the point is that mostly the letters were written by one person, but um, the, he, he, um, this guy, Horan, says that there is a possibility that other people wrote the letters. But interestingly, if you followed everything so far, well, then who wrote the ciphers? Were these also written by 
um, Hal Snook? No. They were kind of designed by him, but some of the ciphers were um, actually written by an individual named Robert Graysmith. And I was like, wait, what? I mean, like, yes, yes, Robert Graysmith. And um, I find that this would be... Um, I mean, once again, this is getting more complicated. We're just kind of stating out the theory right now before we kind of say any sort of counterbalance. Um, and Robert Graysmith was involved with this. A, a big thing to note is that Robert Graysmith is often referred to as a cartoonist for the San Francisco Chronicle. And even in the Jake Gyllenhaal film Zodiac, he is listed as a cartoonist. But one thing that Horan says is that was actually something that he only did um, for some of the time. His primary job with the newspaper was being a production assistant, and he was the one who took photos of the letters that um, the Zodiac had mailed in. It's like he was a production assistant with the newspaper, and being a cartoonist was something that he did as sort of a secondary job. Okay, so, I mean, does this not seem complicated enough? You have the San Francisco Narcotics, Narcotics Department interacting, you know, with different... Um, major drug suppliers as they do. It's all tied into the things like the Golden Triangle, the French Connection, and I mean, that's not a controversial statement. The narcotics departments have undercover informants that interact with all sorts of, you know, drug lords and such. Okay, that's not a controversial statement, but then um, sometimes there are illegal activities that go on, and then people get murdered, and they need to kind they needed a kind of a way to kind of explain certain murders. And for example, Darlene Farron tried to kind of set this thing up where she tried to set up the incident where uh, her ex husband would have been kind of busted, but they really just needed to get her out. And the guy that she was with her that was with her as well, Michael Mago, also needed to kind of they needed to just get rid of these two people. They're making trouble, and that's why it backfired on her. Then you actually get to. Um, you get to Lake Berryessa, September 27th, 1969, and then you have Brian Hartnell and Cecilia Ann Shepard, and they were actually on a hot date. He says very clearly that um, Betty Lou Jensen and David Faraday were not on any sort of, like, hot date. They, Lake Herman Road was not a real lover's lane. Lake Berryessa was. Uh, Brian Hartnell had brought condoms with him. He was, they were going to have sex in the car. That's what that was all about, and, well, hmm. Talk about cock blocking of the absolute worst kind. I can't even think of a worse kind of cock blocking. Ugh, terrible. But um, at the same time, you know, just um, you got somebody like Brian Hartnell who survives this. And the theory that's put forward by Horan is that the first person to rescue Brian Hartnell after him and Cecilia Ann Shepard were stabbed and like hurt and injured was um, a park ranger who actually did the stabbing himself that that guy was actually the uh, person who kind of... 30 minutes went by in between the Zodiac activity, the, the incident in Zodiac activity at Lake Berryessa, and then th this guy leaves, he changes his clothes, he gets rid of the Zodiac hood, he gets rid of the knife, and then he, he comes back, you know, wearing a uniform, dressed as a park ranger, and he actually rescues Brian Hartnell, that it was the same guy. <coughs> Excuse me. And then, of course, Cecilia Ann Shepard passed away from her activities right there. Now, what we have to say about that is um, that was something where a lot of suspicion was put on the park ranger who um, kind of committed the murder. And a lot, a lot of people are just like, everything about Lake Berryessa seemed very suspicious. Everything about the Zodiac incident at Lake Berryessa was suspicious. And a lot of people were kind of raising certain questions. And uh, bear in mind that other people were actually booked as suspects in these murders up to this point, including a person who um, murdered Darlene Farron. Uh, well, you know, he was booked and charged with the murder of Darlene Farron, and he was actually six feet nine inches tall, which is by far taller than anyone associated in the Zodiac case. Definitely, we don't have any reports of someone being six feet nine inches tall. Most likely it was not him, right? And then, so that's why they believe that the Paul Stein murder and the murder of Cecilia Ann Shepard at Lake Berryessa are so close together. It's only two weeks later. It diverted all suspicion away from, once again, everyone involved in the narcotics trade, the park ranger who committed the stabbing of Brian Hartnell and all of that. And that's why Paul Stein was murdered. And an interesting thing that, that, that is noted by Horan is that Two days after the murder of Paul Stein, the fragment of his bloody shirt was mailed in and with a letter. And there's also a letter that was mailed on 
October 14th. Paul Stein was murdered on October 11th of 69. And then the Zodiac mail things on the 13th and the 14th. Okay, but nothing was mailed after Lake Berryessa. Well, I mean, the Zodiac did call it in, though. The murder took place at 6.30, and the call came at 7.40 p.m., only one hour and ten minutes after the, that, after the incident. We've, um, we've talked about that a lot. All right, now, let's do some pushback. To say that Robert Graysmith had any sort of thing to do with the uh, Zodiac killings is one sort of challenge is just that, well, I mean, he took him five years to find a publisher for his book uh, on the Zodiac Killer. I mean, it's like, you know, it's just like he was so difficult for him to get anything out there. And um, it was so difficult for him to raise any sort of awareness and... I mean, no one really wanted to listen to him, and he wasn't really taken that seriously. Um, and furthermore, I just have to say, this is one complicated theory. This is one far-out and twisted theory, and I don't believe that the explanations have been provided well enough about why this individual named Hal Snook would have written the letters. Um, did the um, narcotics department have some leverage on him that they had a pressure point they could put on the guy? Did they have a reason why they could kind of force him? Uh, to um, to do these things, but what I would say is that we've talked about it for a lot for a long time. The Zodiac Killer just seems like incidents that were committed by multiple people. They seem very different, and the only other explanation that I could provide was that um, the uh, th this was just someone who had a very impulsive and changing personality who was intentionally inconsistent. But a big thing that is mentioned by Horan is that um. Th Arthur Lee Allen was identified by Robert Graysmith in the book Zodiac Unmasked, and he was a formal suspect. I believe he's actually the only quote-unquote formal publicly revealed suspect by the San Francisco PD in the Zodiac killings. And he was a sexual predator, a pedophile, sex offender, all of those things. The Zodiac killer was not a sex offender. That's all I can say about that. Um, we've talked about that many times. I'd say that this is one twisted and complicated theory, but... A lot of people have been kind of writing similar things on the wall about the Zodiac Killer being a hoax. Um, first of all, I was like, well, what is it? Just some guy sitting in a police car listening to the scanner? Okay, they, uh, th okay, okay, uh, the, uh, the, the police are going in pursuit now. The police are doing this and that. They're going to Lake Berryessa. Is that what was happening? Okay, so we're going to call in at 740 and we're going to say that, yeah, I committed the murder at Lake Berryessa and it was me. Yes, okay, that's exactly what Horan says. Some guy's sitting with, with a police scanner, listening in and uh, finding out what the police are doing. And that's what, that's what happened after Blue Rock Springs and Lake Berryessa. But, um, I mean, it's going to take some time to digest this thesis statement put forward by Horan that the Zodiac Killer was something that was a group of individuals who were trying to trying to divert attention away from the narcotics trading in San Francisco, and the cover-up was done by the police department. You're dealing with four different people, at least four people, and once again, possibly there's a fifth person present during the murder of Darlene Farron. We have the four major incidents of Zodiac activity, and each one of those was a different person, as well as um, you have Hal Snook writing the letters, and Robert Graysmith involved with some of the ciphers, but I believe he would have... Um, learned about that stuff from Hal Snook, who once again was familiar with the Filipino symbols and such. Um, there was one thing, though, that I didn't completely comprehend. Uh, you know in the Zodiac cipher that was solved, I like killing because killing is so much fun. Maybe I misheard, but I believe that, um, that Horan was saying there's one line at the end that is not solved, where it's a bunch of letters that look like E's and a B and an R and such. There's one line at the end that is not deciphered, and he's saying that if you rearrange those letters, it spells out Robert Smith the second, and um, that that's actually the clue to the Zodiac's identity. But um, I looked at it and I wrote it down on some scratch paper, and no, it doesn't spell out Robert Smith the second or Robert G Smith, because the real name of Robert Gray Smith is Robert Smith the second, and um, he changed his name. His middle name was Gray. His name is Robert Gray Smith, but. He just put his middle name and his last name together, and that became Robert Graysmith. Um, that didn't work out. There's only one R there, and it's like, um, maybe he said something else and I didn't hear correctly. What an what a twisted, complicated thing, but I think, it, I think we have to be very kind of much aware that multiple people were involved with the Zodiac killings because everything is somewhat different. And I would say, though, 
this theory does provide an explanation about why these specific dates were, were used. In my most recent Zodiac upload, I talked about why certain dates were used, like, well, just trying to find some reason, like, I was like, unless you tie it into a sort of an astrological interpretation, there's really no significance to these dates, December 20th, July 4th or 5th, and then September 27th, October 11th, there is no pattern. Well, there's, like, the explanation provided by Horan is that this is something that is, um, kind of, um, just, well, as we said, a, a, a diversion from the narcotics trading in San Francisco so other people wouldn't become more suspicious or their criminal activities wouldn't be revealed to the world. And, um, it even ties into things possibly like the CIA being involved and, I need some more time before I can accept this theory completely. I don't accept it a hundred percent, but I definitely think that um, there, this isn't exactly a hoax. They're, what they're saying is there's a real Zodiac killer thing going on. It just didn't happen in the way that a lot of people are, are thinking about. And I think it's also almost unfair to say that Robert Graysmith created the kind of concept of the Zodiac legend. No, the Zodiac Killer was something that is kind of written about in countless newspapers. Even Richard Gajkowski's newspaper, The Good Times, writes about the Zodiac Killer in this way. So I think that it's very important for us to bear in mind that um, Robert Graysmith is not the epicenter of Zodiac activities. And anyone who follows the Zodiac stuff knows that he's more of like a clown rather than a serious investigator. So that's stuff that is very commonly known to people who have followed the case. And I guess that's where, where we're going to have to leave it for now. Maybe we'll do a part two on this, but all I can say is that um, I definitely think that we are dealing with the psychology of multiple people, unless there is a very, very specific alternative, but um, I, I'm, I'm kind of just glad to hear other people kind of give very articulate reasons why they believe multiple people committed the Zodiac murders and one person did the letters and the ciphers, or maybe two.